Well, good evening, everyone. I'm not sure if Facebook's hearing us. We don't have any, any uh, microphone. That was It's Your Love by Allie. That's one of my favorite Allie songs. Love those Allie songs, those rock flowers. Well, here we are tonight. It, it's uh, Worship in the Word. Looks like the mic's on for, for Facebook and YouTube. It's all set. We're ready to dig into some worship and some word. So let's, um, let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for tonight. Thank you that we can gather in this way. Thank you that you are the Lord of all, and that no matter where we go, what we do, or how we do it, you have been there. There's not a place that we can go that you've not been, as we read last week in Psalm 139. And that means tonight, that means online, that means in heaven and on earth. And I pray, God, that as we come together and we join together in our hearts, as we seek you, that you would be found by us. And we would know that we as we gather in your name, are in your presence because you're right there in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's open up the heavens. Thank you. 
who you are, where you are. That means YouTube. That means Facebook. I know some people are watching on, on YouTube can't, you know, aren't logged in. You're just watching. That's okay. But if, there, if you are logged in, tell us who you are, where you are. Same thing with Facebook. And we will come right back if you check the connection. party check out some of you guys on Facebook I'm seeing who's on on YouTube and uh, yeah we're here and while we're here we're gonna worship and we're gonna dig into the word so let's keep going with who you say I am Thank you. 
trivia time and um, we are back at it yep here we are in the very merry month of may yep we are half um, we are halfway into may already more than halfway which is crazy because it feels like it just started and we just did our first may trivia I but know. here we are may 18th so it's we're we're well into spring. Yes, we are, and mm -hmm. so we decided it's time to do a quiz about spring. So this today's quiz is called Random Spring Trivia. Random Spring Ooh. Trivia. Ooh. So original, we know. Um, but today we're gonna have I think ten questions all about different things in spring. And spring can include, what months can spring include? Well, maybe that's part of the quiz. So oh, well, I'm knows? not going to give anything away. Okay. But we are just going to head right into this quiz. But first, let's do the rules. Ten questions, multiple choice for most of them, but some of them are true or falses. And basically, just guess, put your answer in the chat on Facebook or on YouTube, and make sure to put the number of the question before your answer so we know what question you're referring to, since there's a bit of a, you know, Social media virtual delay. Yeah, and we'll get confused yeah. otherwise. Mm -hmm. Not you, we we get confused. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's get started. All right. Question one. Which state gets the most rain in spring? Oh, is mm -hmm. it A, Arizona? Is it B, Hawaii? Is it C, Texas? Or is it D, Oregon? Which state gets wow. the most most rain, rain in spring. In As spring. music plays, you have time to think about it. So yes. Jeff's right out of the gate with B. He's going to go with oh, Hawaii. Is it Hawaii? Yeah, Hawaii, Texas, or Oregon. Lauren is going to go with Oregon. 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 So Oregon. is Robert C. Mm -hmm. and Lauren. So Let's most see. people what are going with Oregon. Jill Shanko's going with Oregon. Um, Oregon. Oregon. <laughs> Brian Bennett is going with D. So is Bill. And Leah is going with B. So he goes with Hawaii, Asia. and the rest go with Oregon. Kathy's going with D. So we have D and B mostly on our side, but D's have it. So Jeanette's on with the D as well. All right. Hey, Jeanette, Jill, Soren, D. Should we count it down? I think we should count it down. Okay. Hey, three, two, one. The correct answer is B for Hawaii. Hawaii. Hawaii gets the most, uh, the most spring and rain. The most rain in. Spring. How about that? So Wendy, yeah. sometimes following the crowd is not the right yeah. direction to go. Uh, Lori said D as well, so it's Hawaii. How about that? Wow, interesting. I right. want to go to Hawaii in the spring. I want to go to Hawaii, period. It's a very nice place there. Yeah. Anyway, question two. All right. This one is a true or false. Okay. So listen closely while Abby's rebooting the computer. Yes. This is easy because it's a true or false, and the statement is, Tornadoes are most common in spring. Is this true or is this false? Guess we're about to find out. Tornadoes. Are they most common, most likely to happen in the spring? Or in any other season? We'll see. Let's see what you guys have to say. You guys check this out. I'm going to bring this back online. Okay. Jeff says true. Lorena says true. Uh... Brian and Bill both say false. So we got trues on Facebook and some falses on YouTube. Wendy says true. Jill says true. Robert C. Bliss says true. And Leah over here says true. Everyone's a lot of trues going on, but oh, Lauren's Lauren on with says false. He joins Brian and Bill in false. Let's see. Anyone else on YouTube? When else do tornadoes occur? I mean, I would imagine they're. I know. 
Uh, we got our music back on. I Thank think that means it's ready to count down. And uh, we're in question two now. So, yep. tornadoes, most common in spring, true or false? All right, the correct answer is true. I was waiting for the music. The correct <laughs> answer is true. Tornadoes are most common in the springtime. How about that? Question three. What are the, the spring months in Australia? Can you do this with an Australian accent? Australia. Is it A, September to December? Is it B, October to December? Do you like my Australian You're a little more English. Australia's a little... Australia's a little more, like, rugged. Yeah, exactly. A, September to December. B, October de to December. C, September to November. Or D, March to June. Excellent. You like my Australian accent. I'm, I've done British accents for a play that I just finished, but never done an Australian accent okay. for a show. But <laughs> maybe in the future. Well, Jeff's saying B, and so is Jill. They're both going with B. Let's see what you guys say. YouTube, Leah is going with C, and Brian is going with B. Good going, guys. Spring must end. That's what Robert C is going with. Down on C. That. And so is Lauren Cora Walt. And Wendy's on with a C as well. And B for Bill goes with B. Okay. Then I think we should count it down. Count it down. Three, two, one. The correct answer is C. September to November. Oh, you guys know something we so didn't know. Jeanette okay. and Bill both got it right over here. And yep. Kathy. And the other Bill and Jeanette and Wendy. Okay, a lot of good C's going on. Yeah. So and Jerry. <laughs> Jerry's on with a C as well. All right. All right. We got some smart people. We over do, here. we do. Okay, question four. four. How much sunlight do we get each day during springtime? Is it mm. A, 11 hours, B, 10 hours, C, 13 hours, or D, 12 hours? How much sunlight do we get in spring? Let's see what you guys have to say about that in the music. Well, I think this question is debatable, you know, because it depends it on where depend you where, where you are. live, and especially in New Jersey, our springs we get no sunlight; it's all clouds. I mean, we've it's, gotten some sun. We got some sun today, thing. thank the Lord, and we will get some sun this weekend. But I don't think you're going to see the sun much tomorrow. It I looks know. like a rainy Thursday. It's okay though. All right, but Jeff's going with C, Robert C's going with D, and Wendy's going with C on this one. Brian and Leah go with D, and Bill is going with A. Okay. And Jill's going else? with C as well. And so, so is, is Jeanette. Jeanette C is going right. with C. So is Bill over here on Facebook. Should we count it down? Count it down. Three, two, one. The correct answer is 12 hours D. Mm, 12 hours. 12 okay. hours of school sunlight each day yeah you know it's it's debatable jerry's saying 11 because you know it's like the vernal equinox yeah. is half the day but anyway that let's move true. on that from true. that question i have a feeling okay that can be debated. question five what is the sunniest period of spring hmm. oh is it a may to june is it b april to may or is it c march to april all right this well that's one, a good question yeah hmm. It's like it could be some of these choices that are debatable. Too, yeah, definitely, definitely. Jeff's going right out of the gate with A on five. Five A, he says. Let's see what you guys say on So does Lorena. Let's see. Bill says five A. He's going with May to June. And Brian is also saying May to June, five A. Robert C is going with B. Wendy's going with A. Kathy is going with A as well. And so is Leah on YouTube. Leah's going with A. And so is Jerry. And Jill. Should we count it down? Yeah, let's count it down. All right. Three, two, one. The correct answer is A. May to June is the sunniest period of spring, and I do believe that. That makes sense, yeah. right? Because yeah. this June is the best. Our March and April was kind of sunny. April to May was not that sunny, unfortunately. I wonder if they mean like when the days are longer or when the cloud cover is less. I don't know. Well, that is debatable, but most of you guys got it right. May to June is the sunniest period. Okay. Question six. What causes most spring allergies? Well, this one, I have a lot of friends who have allergies. I do have allergies to spring, but mildly, very mildly. So let's see what causes them. Is it A, the blooming trees? Is it B, flowers? Is it C, bee pollen? Or is it D, dandelion dander? 
Wow, that would be dandy if that was the answer. <laughs> it definitely would. Okay, well, Jeff's going to go with C. Jill's going with A on this one. Lorena Lee is going with A, and Kathy's going with C. Definitely. So A's and C's are in competition here. How about dandy, on YouTube? Dandy, 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 dandy. All right. On YouTube, we have Bill who says A, Blooming Trees, and Brian says A, and so does Leah. They all are in unison over there. Is it unity? I like unison. It sounds like no, they're... it's uh, well, unison. You, it could be unison or unity. So whatever you guys want, you guys are all agreeing on blooming trees. Let's see what you guys say. <laughs> all right. And so... Raphael Julio comments blooming onions. Yeah, that could bring about some allergies as well. Could, it could Rob Rockefeller is saying A on this one. Hey, Rob. Um, and Jeanette is also going with A on this one as well. All right, let's count it down. Three, two, one. Yes, A is the correct answer. Blooming trees. Blooming causes trees. Most spring allergies. And it's not the bees, it's the trees, huh? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right, Jerry says A on that I one. I would have liked to. All right, let's turn the page and keep it going. We're on a roll here. Remember, seven. this is random May trivia, right? Yeah, random, uh, random spring. Oh, spring trivia. trivia. Okay, random spring trivia. Question seven Why do so many birds sing in spring? Is it A, a mating call? Is it B, the sun makes them sing? Is it C, communication to flock? Or is it D, the mother birds calling to their young? Why do so many birds sing in spring? That's a good I like to sing in spring as well. Yeah, um, that's a good rhyme, yeah. okay. All right, let's see what you guys have to say about that. All right, so that seven one. is uh, coming up quick. Is, is Lorena with an A, Jeff with a D, Robert with an A, Jill with an A. Bill right. is going with, a, <laughs> with an A and... <laughs> Anyone on here? I'm sure a lot. Uh, I don't think we have any more YouTube answers. Ooh. Bill, oh, here comes Leah with A. Got a lot of A's. Jeanette, Kathy, maybe. Rob are going with A. Diane's on tonight. Hi, Diane. Jerry's going with B. Jerry with D is going with B. Hmm. Wendy is going with A on this one. All right, let's count you know, it down. Once there was a gloomy bird who lived in the big bell tower, and every time he tried to sing, the clock would ring the hour. He opened up his little mm -hmm. mouth. And try so hard to sing. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> okay. Count it down. Five, four, three, two, one. The correct answer is a mating call. The mating birds call. sing in spring because of a mating call. It is time for. Let me hear if, if I can get a bird to, <laughs> to, to sing back to me. Ready? What? Worked, yeah. Yeah, I, I it did. He has like a very like. I think I have a date with a bird tonight. The birds love. Sure. <laughs> yeah, he Don't just tell mating call to a bird. And okay, bird let's welcome. move on. Let's move. On. <laughs> Question eight: How many tulips bloom in the Netherlands each spring? Mm, who counts them? I know. <laughs> okay. All right. A. Less than one hundred. B. Exactly one hundred one thousand and twenty-four. C. Less than one million. Or D, more than seven million. Wow. Do the Netherlands have a lot of tulips? I don't even know. We'll find out after this question, I guess. Right. Jill saying D, so is Jeff D. Brian is going with A, which is yeah. less than 100. Lorena is going with D. Robert C is going with D. Jeff D is going with, you guessed it, D. Uh, Leah is going with D over here on YouTube. And Jeff is going with E, all of them. All I of them. That, that is work. a good answer, too. Uh, Bill is going with D as well, more than 7 million. Jeanette and Wendy are going with D. All right, let's count it down. Three, two, one. So it was wrong. Oh, <laughs> and the correct answer is D, more than 7 million wow. tulips. Who Blue counts in the these things? I hope whoever counts them is not allergic to tulips. I know, I know, I would hope that it's too. Miserable. It's a count lot them. of tulips. All right, winding down question nine. Which insect can visit 2,000 flowers each day? <gasps> is it a green caterpillar? Is it B, the mealybug? Is it C, bees? Or is it D, flying black mite? Mm. I, don't I don't want to be visited by the flying black mite. Sounds a little nightmarish, don't you think? It sounds nightmarish to me, actually. Yeah. All right, so Jeff's going with C, Jill C, Robert C is going with C, Brian is going with C. Brian and Bill and Leah are also going with C. We got our YouTube squad on C. 
see. Laura's going with C. Hi, Laura. Kathy's on C. Jeanette C is going with you guessed it C. C. All right, let's come. I it think down. everyone is going yeah. C B. Everyone B's. is saying C, which is B's, and that turns out to be the correct. The correct answer. answer. And Rob's going with the flying black mate. That's just here for the flying black black mate. Rob gave one vote. But yeah, the question answer was CBs, good buddy. Jeff says, shouldn't the Bs be the B answer? That is true. But would have given it away, Jeff. It would yeah. have, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Question 10, our final, last question. Final question. Final question. Which spring month do butterflies hatch? Is there just one or two or three? We'll find out. Is okay. it A, March and April? B, March, C, April and May? Or D, May. So which spring months do butterflies hatch? Yeah. Month or months? It could be month or months. March and April, March, April and May, or May. All right, we're getting some answers. Bill says 10 D, May. All right, well, here we go. Laura's going with A, Jeff's going with A. Nubia, hi, you're on. And I'm so glad, we love having Robert on. And, um, Lorena saying C, Wendy C, Robert C, not Nubia this time, A, A, Robert, Jeanette's going with A, Jill's going with C. Let's see what you guys say over here. Bill and Brian both say D, and Leah does too. We got So does Robert. Our oh, I'm sorry, Robert's one. going with A. There's a lot of different answers here. Yeah, we do some varied answers. Let's so, see. So, for the final answer, which spring months do butterflies Why hatch? Why don't you count it down and let us know? Be correct. Oh. Five, four, three, two, one. The correct answer is A. March and April are the spring months that butterflies hatch. So that means you're talking about they're in a, the, the caterpillars in the chrysalis. Yes, the chrysalis. All like maybe part of the winter. Cocoon. The cocoon, the whole bit. And then they, they come they out. Hatch. Yeah, that's what they hatch. So all the butterflies are out of that chrysalis already? Probably. Wow, they're on, they're on the Unless scene. they're like built different. They're on the scene. All, All right. right. Well, thank you, Phoebe, for your yeah. famous trivia. Enjoy. All right, guys. Well, now it's time to get into the Word of God. So in keeping with this spring theme, something I came up with you for today is we're talking about the parable of the sower. Not the sowing machine sower, but the sower sowing the seeds in the soil. Do you know, this should have been one of our trivia questions, that, do you know that right now, this month, last week, this week, maybe part of next week, is the time of year that farmers are popping seeds in the ground for most of their crops in New Jersey, particularly soybeans, but more favorably, corn. Corn seeds are going in the ground right now. I know they planted a little bit late. They say that it's a better way to go with corn as far as what I've read. So the corn that you're gonna be eating, the corn that should be knee high by the 4th of July, the Jersey sweet corn, that you're gonna be eating all summer, those seeds are in the ground right now. They're being popped in as we speak uh, this week, yeah, next week, and maybe even some went in today. And let's hope that they came upon or fell upon or were you know, planted upon good soil. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Jesus gave us 50 parables. A third of his teaching was through parable form. A parable, a parable is a story, it's um, sort of like a, a story that's created to teach a moral lesson. This is a common method of teaching. Jesus didn't invent it. Back then, they would speak in parables. In the ancient world, you would hear parables. Um, sometimes the fables, like Aesop's fable and Homer's and things like that, were stories, some short, some long, but they had some type of meaning to them. And so that was pretty common. But Jesus used these parables to teach important eternal truths about the kingdom of God. Now, think about this. Jesus was a creative author. You may not have ever thought of him that way, but he was a guy, like many creative authors, whether you're a short story writer, a novelist, or whatever it might be, to think and to sit and think about what you're going to write about. I'm sure because he's the author of creation, he was able to just flow with these stories, but they were brilliant and they were imaginative. Like, for instance, his, his parables were constructed with the things that short stories need. Character development, plots, conflicts, settings, themes, and then obviously a significant moral of the story. And so what's, what was also interesting is that they're not necessarily religious works. Here's what I mean by that. His stories didn't always contain uh, characters like, well, like God or the angels or the prophets or 
scripture, things like that. They were about more mundane, common things. He would write stories about farmers and kings and sons and daughters and seeds and fields and rocks and birds and soil and plant and crops and sheep, all that kind of stuff. So I would imagine that if you collected all his 50 or so parables and put them into a volume form, they would not end up in the religious department of the, the religious section of Barnes and Noble or the bookstore, except for the fact that Jesus wrote them. But if it were written by anybody else, they would just be short stories, which is interesting. Well, I like that about that. See, Jesus, he did this because he wanted to reach common listeners, people who could understand these things. And he also wanted to keep the, the, uh, the truths out of the minds of the Pharisees. They would be very cleverly concocted so that the Pharisees would be frustrated because he knew they knew that there was symbolism. They knew that they were kind of maligned in some of these stories as the bad guys, but they couldn't prove it because it was all symbolism and, and parable. Later in his ministry, Jesus spoke very plainly to the Pharisees and uh, called them, you know, brothers of snakes and whited tombs, whitewashed tombs. All right, so in Mark chapter four, we're gonna read a parable. Now, Jesus at this point is very popular. He's a really popular guy. I, I know a lot of us think about Jesus as someone who was obscure, him and his apostles would just wander around and no one knew who they were, but the word had spread. At this point, Jesus and his apostles were very, very popular. They had done miracles. They cast out many demons. They angered the Pharisees by healing on the Sabbath, so they were notorious as well as popular. And, you know, the Pharisees are actually plotting to kill him. So things are out of the bag, so to speak. The horse is out of the barn when it comes to Jesus. And here we go. He's by the lake shore. He spent a lot of time by the coast. It says this in Mark 4, 1 through 2. It says, once again, uh, I'm sorry, listen. And this, oh, by the way, this is called the parable of the seeds for the sower. Parable of the seeds for the sower. So, once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. And he taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables such as this one. Listen, he says, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered it across the field, some of the seed fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil and with underlying rock. So the seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the seed, the plant soon wilted under this hot sun. And since it didn't have any roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked the tender plants so they produced no grain. And still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they sprouted and grew and produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. Imagine that for corn, right? So think about that. He plants these seeds. The farmer plants some on soil that is by the footpath and birds eat it. No corn's going to come from that. It's gone. It already became a meal. Second, the ones that fell on the shallow soil, uh, they, it came up and wilted, right? So, so when the hot sun came out and it's trying to draw, you know, nutrients from the soil and from the water and the moisture on the soil, it had none. It just wilted and died. No corn for that guy. And then there's another one that, that grew up among the thorns. So as this sprout was growing up, maybe a thorny bush wrapped around it, a vine, and kind of just dragged it down. There's no way that thing's going to produce anything. But the one that fell on good soil, can you imagine a field of, of uh, corn stalks and they're, all of them have multiple ears of corn, that one little grain of seed, a corn kernel, grew up this whole stalk and maybe more. And then he said in verse 9, then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. And he replied, you're permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, but I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then he quotes Isaiah and he says, when they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. And this is talking about a scripture in actually Isaiah 6 of all places. It's an interesting place for this to be to pull from. 
Because Isaiah 6 is a very famous scripture for something else, Isaiah's commissioning. I quote this a lot. We quote this a lot in, in Messianic Jewish services. The Kadoshah, which is Kadosh, 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 comes from this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was seated on the throne. You know, and the angels gathered around, and the train of his throne filled the camp. You know, it. it's Kadosh, 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 Adonai, Sephiot, the Lord of hosts. Anyway, after um, Isaiah says, you know, I'm a man of unclean lips, the angel comes and touches, grabs the coal from the altar with the tongs, touches his lips, cleans him, and they say, who will we send? And he says, here am I, send me. Now, all that happens, and then it says this, and then it says, what they say, uh, what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they do not understand. And basically, he's talking about the Pharisees. See, that you could speak to them the truth, and if they don't have ears to hear, they won't understand. And that even applies to us, friends. When we're talking about the truths of, of Scripture or spiritual truth, you're talking about something that really great happened to you in the Lord, an experience that you had where you're experiencing his joy and, and depths of worship or overcoming something through his victory or someone coming to faith. And you tell your friend that, if they're not spiritually awakened, they'll probably be like, uh-huh, yeah, well, you look so great about that. <laughs> they don't get it. And that's what the Pharisees did. They just did not get it. Verse 13 says, then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? He explains it. The farmer plants seeds by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents the, those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. Keep that in mind. I won't explain it as we go. Maybe I will. You hear the message. Someone heard the word of God, but the devil is always just trying to deceive and discredit the things of God, and immediately they allow it to leave their mind, and they just continue on with their life. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. So it's like someone who very, in a very shallow way receives the word. Says, Jesus, sure, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get that. I'll get into him for a little bit. I'll try the born again thing. But if they don't really dig in, and if they don't really walk the walk and, and build up the foundation of their faith, they're just shallow. And, you know, soon enough, they'll wither away. Then verse 18, the seed that fell among the thorns represents Others who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, or the desire of other things. So no fruit is produced. <clears throat> Once again, that could be you or me. We hear the word, we follow the Lord, but there's other things in our life that are competing for our attention. Things that don't uh, promote and, and work towards God's purposes in our life. In fact, they sap our energy. They distract us and they keep us from being fruitful. And it could be the lure of wealth. It could be the desire for other things, or it could just be worries. It really could. You could be someone who really knows the word, walking with the Lord, but you're so worried about the economy or about the energy or about the prices or about politics or about anything that you just are, you're so worried that you're not bearing fruit. You're not flowing in ministry. That's the seed that can be choked, choked up, choked away by others. And then finally, 20. And when the seed that fell on good soil, that represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest. In other words, they don't fall into the same demise as the other seeds did. And they produce a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as has been planted. All right. Now, Jesus doesn't always explain his parable. Sometimes he just leaves you hanging. But this time he did. And those are the explanations. We're planting seeds by taking God's word to all. That's what we need to know that the, the seed that he's talking about here, here is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. All right. So the footpath is the hard soil. The rocky soil is the one that keeps us from having roots. The seed that falls upon thorny soil is the one that gets choked out. And then finally, the good soil are those who. Two things, hear and accept, hear and accept, and they have abundant blessing. You know, what's interesting in this parable is that three quarters of the seed were wasted in this parable. Think about that. If the farmer only planted 
four seeds, then he would only have one seed bearing fruit. However, that seed could produce 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. That's how it is with the word of God. The small things that we do can have incredibly great dividends. I hope that you know that. In the New Living Translation, it left out a key word in verse 15, and I want to hone in on that because I think I believe I, I use the NLT. I don't always use that one, but I did for that. Uh, sometimes the stories flow nicely. But it, they say so much about the parable of the soil when it means to us it's the word heart. So let's switch gears on Mark 4, 15 and read the same verse in the New King James Version. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes the word that was sown in their hearts. I think that's an important distinction because our hearts are the soil. The condition of our heart when we receive the word of God makes the difference in how effective it'll be. Now, what's your heart? It's not the, you know, the blood in the middle of your side chest with the aortas and the ventricles. It's not that. What we're talking about is the part of our being, part of our mind and our emotion and our will that is most prone to receiving and believing, believing in God, exercising faith and receiving from the Lord. It's the thing we're most, most passionate about. It's the height of our soul, really. It's the depth of our soul that's, that's the most passionate about something. That's why when you fall in love, you give somebody your heart. When you First and foremost, you want to worship God with all your heart and then your soul, mind, strength. Heart comes first. So heart is the part of you that where things mean the most. It's, it's passionate. Romans 10 tells us it's the heart that allows us to believe unto righteousness. If we believe in our hearts, we could be saved. So the hearts of the soil, the condition of our heart makes a big difference. So if our, number one, if our heart is hardened, It'll simply not take root. But we'll hear the word, but maybe due to bitterness or unbelief or unhealed wounds or disappointments, you name it. Our hearts can be so hardened that we can receive the word and hear the word, but it doesn't penetrate us. We're like Teflon. You know? And if it doesn't, because our heart is so hardened, we become like that soil. Number two, if our hearts are shallow, if our hearts are shallow, they could become overwhelmed. The, the Shallowness doesn't provide growth and strength. And you know what? Sometimes that shallowness, the only remedy for shallowness is to deepen the wells of our heart. And that means digging in. Sometimes it's a messy and dirty and painful job. Sometimes it means you have to go through years of perseverance and faithfulness in hard times. And then you start to become deep, not shallow in your heart. And so if you're too shallow, where you don't dwell the depths, so to speak, of your heart, the word becomes shallow as well that receives that you receive. And then number three, sometimes we dwell among our, our thorns, our hearts even. Receive the word and it takes up, but other things are in our heart. You know, the Bible tells us that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Well, your treasure might not just be your, you know, your chest of gold that you have in your dungeon or your treasure is things like your time, your attention, your money, your resources, your devotion, things like that. That's your treasure. And wherever that is, well, that's where your heart is also. So sometimes our treasure is among thorns, meaning things that are not the fruit of God. And then finally, this is the good one. If our hearts are like good soil, we will be fruitful. And this is those who hear with a pure heart. They believe God's word. They trust God. It cultivates them within them. And, and they allow God to teach them perseverance, teach them faithfulness. And Jesus says that when we accept God's word, hear and accept, it'll produce the harvest. Friends, it's so important to guard your heart and to keep your heart pure before the Lord and always be willing to allow your heart to be fertile ground for the word of God to speak in it. Because if we become hard or bitter or shallow, we're not going to receive the planting of the Lord. We're not going to be able to cultivate the harvest that he has. God is the sower. He's the one that puts the word. He does the planting. He gives us the seed, but it's up to us 
what we do with it. James says this in James 1, 20 through 21. So get rid of all filth and evil in your life and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. James must be Jesus' parable. He's his half-brother. But he says, get rid of all filth and evil and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. And he goes on to say, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to, God, to God's word. Do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. The Bible tells us to not just be hearers, but doers of the word. It's one thing to hear and sit and do nothing. It's another thing to hear and respond. So is God producing fruit in your life? I'm sure he's planting seed. And this is a good time to think about it. Because it's, like I said, New Jersey, drive around the farms, you'll see seeds being planted and um, harvest is being prepared. On that, there was a revivalist by the name of Charles Finney. And he um, had the series of revival lectures in 1874. And some of them were based on Hosea and some of the other minor prophets. And the revival lectures contained one very powerful sermon called Break the Fallow Ground. The Fallow Ground. How many people ever use the word fallow? Fallow Ground. And fallow is an old word that means land that was once fruitful, but now has been unused for so long that it has become unfruitful. It's usually hard, rocky, overgrown. It looks nothing like the, you know, the, the uh, luxurious soils of the farms that are being. But that's what fallow ground is. It may have once been a beautiful farmland, but now it's just hard, rocky, and overgrown by weeds. Well, you know, our hearts can be that way. They can get that way. That's why Hosea 10, 12 says this. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Ah, think about that. Your heart is this fallow, fallow ground. And the Lord's going to break it up like a farmer would plow and till the soil until it's kind of exposed, but then the rain comes upon it. And that rain comes, that's when it becomes fruitful. And, 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 uh, and uh, what's the word for crops? You know, cultivate fruitfulness. Fertile, there you go. Finally, let's just read it again in the NLT. Same scripture, Hosea 10, 12. Plant the good seeds of righteousness, and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up your hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come shower righteousness upon you. How about that? All right, guys, so that's what we're doing. We are plow, plowing and planting the good seed on, on the soil. Just by doing what you're doing tonight shows me that you are a God seeker who desires the word of God to penetrate into your heart. And do something really good. You could have done anything tonight. You could have, it's a nice evening, you know, sitting and watching the computer screen might not have been everybody's first choice, but when it's worship and the word, I think that's a really good high priority. So God bless you. Thank you for being part of this Bible study. And now we're going to get into some prayer and get into the worship as well. All right, let's pray. So we've got a lot of requests here. I'm just going to bring them before God. Oh, Lord, we're so grateful, God, that we can just um, meet with you. No matter where we are, you can cry out and you hear us because we're your children. So grateful, Lord, um, you've made a way for us to become adopted and in your family. Lord, I'm just lifting up um, these uh, serious requests. I'm lifting up Lily to you, 11-year-old Lily, who's hit by a car. Lord, um, we pray for her. We pray for her brain injury. We pray, Lord, that um, you would restore whatever is um, damaged. Lord, we also just pray just for full recovery for her. And she has another surgery coming up that your hand, hands would be on her, Lord, and uh, you would bring her to full health. And Lord, we're lifting up nine-year-old Sawyer to you. He has brain cancer, and um, he's in his third round of chemo, and he feels 
uh, that his spirits are low and, and he's very emotional, doesn't think he can get through it. Lord, we pray for your mercy over him, Lord. We pray, God, that you would just meet him in that place and he would feel your strength and, 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 um, and that you would give him the courage that he needs um, and the supernatural strength to get through this. We're lifting up Emily to you who has an a eye issue and trying to figure out what's going on tomorrow. She's got to go to Philadelphia for testing and evaluation. So, Lord, we pray, God, that you would just um, talk to what's happening and that um, it wouldn't be anything bad and that she would just have uh, treatment and um, be on the way to full health with her eye. Lord, lifting up our friend Sally Ann, who lost her mom a few days ago, yesterday, I think. And um, Lord, we do pray, God, that you would just um, pour your tender mercies over Sally Ann and her family as she just was very close with her mom. Just uh, meet her in that sad place and just walk her through, Lord. And we're lifting up Michael to you, um, who's going through cancer treatment and going through chemo, so, uh, strong chemo. Lord, we pray that you just sustain him, pray that you get him through and bring him to full healing. Lifting up Lauren to you. Uh, who's got eye surgery this week, Lord, we pray, God, that you would just um, help the surgery to go well and uh, it would correct whatever is going on there. Lifting up Laura to you, um, who is just asking for prayer. She's going through some infusions and she's just praying that this would start to help and um, uh, take care of her health issues. Lord, we pray just for your healing hand up. Lifting up Anne's sister in Florida who has serious health issues. Lord, we pray for her. We pray, Lord, that bring her to full health and give her your peace. Praying for our friend Jeff, um, who's got AFib and needs to have that taken care of. Lord, we pray, God, that you would just um, guide and direct him to the right doctors and they would be able to handle that and that your hand would heal him. And lifting up friends down and past you, just praying for peace and joy over them love you so much, Lord. We're so grateful that we can bring this list to you in your hands. And we pray all of it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Hey. 
of the Lamb in the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb in the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. Savior, worthy of honor and glory. Worthy of all of our praise, you are the King. Jesus, awesome in power forever, awesome in great is your name. testimony and Jesus says in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me. So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Thank you for being with us today. So glad to share the word with you and share worship with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.